Valley Church, standing people worship. Come on, put your hands together. Come on.
probably have a close relationship that you really value and maybe at some point in the span of that relationship you've been this person man I wish that person was more thankful for me but maybe you're this other person and you actually 
are really thankful for that person, but you don't say it. You don't express it. And I'm not a communications major, but it sounds like a communication problem y'all might be having. But it also might be a vulnerability problem. And the thing is with vulnerability, you can't force someone to be vulnerable. That's, that's never worked. Hey, you need to be more vulnerable with me. But you can ask them to be more vulnerable. And I'm going to ask our church, this team, our staff, in 2024 to be more vulnerable with God. In your quiet time, in your prayer life, in your worship. Now, here's my why this morning. Because he loves you and he wants to hear your voice. And we're going to sing these next few songs. It's you crying out to God and saying, God, here's my worship. I give it to you.
minute I start to forget All of the great things you did When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe That you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? You are more than me. You sing that with me. Come on. You are.
we were we were praying together as a team before Sunday in the year, and I'm already losing it. Um, we were praying before the service with the worship team, and it was obvious that uh, for this year, for many people, could be summed up with that prayer God, you are more than able. And I know that many of you walked in this room carrying something that you need God to, to fix. And that's why we're here. We're going to ask Him to do it. We're going to ask Him to intervene. We're going to ask Him to speak and move on behalf of whatever you're carrying. And so, in the Spirit, I would... Jacob just taught us, if you're willing to be vulnerable, you don't have to be. If you're willing to, if there's something like that going on in your life, would you just raise your hand? Okay. And because Liz shared with us what's going on in her life, can I pray over you? And if you would, just put a hand on someone next to you as I pray. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, Father, we come to you and we declare that you are more than able for all the things that we carry and that we face that seem too great for us. God, nothing is too great for you. God, for Liz and her family, we pray for her mother today. God, would you please watch over her would you slow the progression of her disease? Would you allow more years with her and be with her father this morning as he has to be courageous and make a very hard decision to lead his family well. And I pray that you'd be with him. We pray for everyone who raised their hand, God, that you would meet them where they are, that you would Remind them that they're not alone, that you are more than able. And so, God, we call on you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. And I'm going to pull myself together. Uh, gosh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, well... You're dismissed. Go home. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, that sounds like, how are we, we going to do this here? No, um, if you have your Bibles, let's open them to John chapter 4. That's the Gospel of John. If you're not familiar with your Bible, uh, just go to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you will find your way to John. And I'm going to ask one of my lovely family members to bring me a tissue. <laughs> Thank you. All right, John chapter 4, we'll be there in just a minute, and, uh, but I want to share a little story with you in the fall of, or not, yeah, probably the fall of uh, 2006, I was involved in, uh, in a lot of ministry, that was kind of my younger days of ministry, and was uh, stretching my legs in ministry, and um, uh, up to that point, I had begun to do a lot of young adult ministry, some of you knew me back then, you knew me as the guy that did singles ministry, young adult ministry, and uh, I, had, I had begun to... Uh, really learn how to do that better and better. And I was actually invited to speak in different places. And so <clears throat> I was uh, kind of growing in that whole communication thing and learning how to teach. And uh, because of that, got some invitations. And I was actually invited by a church up in Nashville, up in the Brentwood area, to come uh, lead a young adult ministry there. And we would, I would go up there every Monday night and do this ministry and co come back late Monday night. And uh, some of you remember those days, and some of you were even with me on the, some of those days. And uh, but uh, this was a, a really cool opportunity, and this church was a, an historic church, uh, Brentwood United Methodist Church. Some of you are familiar with the church. Uh, historic church in, in uh, uh, 
Brentwood, and they had a pastor there. He, he has passed away since, uh, but his name was Dr. Howard Olds. And uh, Dr. Olds was this incredible man. Um, he was like six foot four. He was huge, big, just strong man. When you shake his hand, he's one of those guys when you shake his hand, you feel like, you're, like he's, his hand's made of concrete, like just firm, handshake kind of guy. And this big, towering man. He was much older and just impressive. He was that pastor that everybody in the church wanted time with. Even the people on his staff wanted time with him, but his time was, you know, he was very busy. He has a lot of stuff going on. His time was at a premium. And this ministry that we got started, we were reaching, you know, several hundred young adults on Monday nights down there. And we would, and he took an interest in that and took an interest in me. And he started opening up time for me. And I felt just incredibly privileged to get time with him. This seasoned pastor was pouring into me, this young guy. And, uh, and I was just so grateful for that. And I know that there were <clears throat> other people on that staff that wished they had the access to him that I was given. And so I got to meet with him on occasion and learn from him. And he poured a lot into me. Um, he later passed away in 2008 of brain cancer. Um, but during the time I was working there, or going up there, um, he took this interest in me. And then he invited me uh, to to preach on a Sunday morning at his church. Their church was booming in these days. I mean, they were packing out every service and they had, some of you have been to churches like this, they had two different styles of worship. They had a traditional service, which is the traditional Methodist church service that they had. And then they had a contemporary service, which basically means a rock and roll service. And so they had these two services. They were appealing to different people. They were both busting at the seams, these two different services. So he invited me to come preach at this contemporary worship service. And it was, the, it was the fastest growing thing at their church. They were just blowing and going. A lot of young families coming. It was really cool. It was a huge honor to get asked to preach at this service. So I go up there to preach at it. And uh, about a, two weeks before that, the service program director sends me the rundown of the day. There's like, I mean, everything's on a clock. Everything's got their time slot. I got my time slot. I knew what the songs were, all of that. So I get prepared. I go there. I remember I'm staying with some friends up there. I get up early the next morning, I <clears throat> get dressed, get ready, get to the church early, and man, there's just an energy in the church. Feels a lot like our church feels right now. A lot of energy in the church, people excited. Man, I just was feeling the energy and the buzz, and I get in there, and the music starts. It was great. They, they actually met in this old chapel, big, tall, stained glass windows on each side with pews and rock and roll. It was awesome, and, uh, and so we were in there, and it was it was my time to go up. So I go up. I have, you know, all this pent up energy. I go up there and man, I preach the lights out. Um, I mean, I, it was, I just was like, man, this is great. Everybody was just eating it up. It was one of those moments where you could just tell everybody was with me. So I preached and preached and preached, got down, man, after the service was over, I mean, my hand was sore. How many people I had to shake hands with, and they were telling me, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was so great. Thank you. I mean, I could, I, I'm telling you, inside of me, I could feel Dwayne the Rock Johnson's character from Moana. Maui was warming up going, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And I was feeling it, man. I was feeling good. They, they told me how good I was, and I was believing it. And so I just kind of left on cloud nine, went back to Memphis and continued ministering these things. And then about two weeks later, I got a letter. You guys know what those are? These are pa pieces of paper <laughs> that go in an envelope and they seal it and they put a stamp on it and they send it to somebody. That's what a letter is. I got a letter, not an email, not a phone call, not a text message. I got a letter. The letter was addressed to me from the office of Dr. J. Uh, Dr. J. Howard Olds, pastor of Brentwood United Methodist Church. That was the letterhead. I could feel Maui warming up. This is another thank you note. So I open this thing up, and he goes into saying he was glad that I came and he said some nice things, and then he got into the, the reason why he wrote the letter. He said, Andy, you were given a specific time frame on your message, and you exceeded it and created a domino effect in the church that created confusion and frustration for all the various ministries and other things going on in the church. And it was irresponsible of you, 
and I'm writing this letter to confront you on this, and I'm asking you and even telling you, don't ever do that again. Signed, Dr. J. Howard Olds. I wanted to crawl under my desk. I, that, was, that still ranks as one of the top two or three most embarrassing moments of my life reading that letter. It felt like this inescapable spotlight was put on my life. This thing, I, would, I had begun to believe I was something. I had made, in truth, I had made that worship service all about me. It was about my opportunity. It was about what I had to say. It was about people looking at me. It was about me becoming a little celebrity. And Dr. J. Howard Olds was right. And he was the one who loved me enough to tell me the truth. Have you guys ever had one, anyone like that in your life? Someone who loved you enough to actually tell you the truth. It's funny. The, the title of this message is literally, Thank You, Dr. Howard Olds. It's because I am so grateful. Because he was right and because I needed to hear that, he knocked me off a pedestal of my own making, gave me a good dose of humility that I needed, and helped me see something about myself that I could not see and would not see on my own. And the result of that confrontation is my gratitude for this man who has now been deceased since 2008. I was heartbroken at his death because all of that wisdom, all of that insight was now gone with him. But he loved me enough to cause pain in the interest of my growth and maturity. We need people like that in our lives. We need people who are willing to cause pain in the interest of our own growth and our own maturity. And we all know it too because if you've ever had someone like that in your life, you may not have liked the moment. I did not like reading that letter. I wanted to get away from it. I wanted to make excuses. I wanted to say stupid things that pastors say like the spirit's more important than your time frame. Except when you're a guest in their house. Except when they told you two weeks in advance what your time slot was and you were not responsible enough to write your message and deliver it according to the time frame. There was an agreement that we had. It was a quiet, shared agreement because of the time frame. And I broke the agreement. I did not fulfill what I was supposed to do. I wanted to get away from the pain of that. I didn't want to face that. But the reality was I needed to know that. Because since then I have delivered probably thousands of messages since then. And you know what? Every single one of those messages ultimately have a start time and an end time. He was helping me grow in something that I am called to and gifted to do. He made me better. So do you have someone like that in your life? So we all stand to benefit from people who have the heart to keep our best interest in mind and have the spine to speak the truth into our lives as an act of love. And that's really the quest of this whole series is we're trying to figure out what it looks like to have both heart and spine, spine and heart. Because we love people. We want people to do well. We want people around us to, to be blessed and to do well. The problem is, sometimes in the name of love, we extract the truth. And then there's those people who, in the name of love, they give truth and no grace at all. So we have to figure this out because we live in a world, by the way, our culture right around us does not like this whole concept of truth. This whole balance of spine and heart. Because you know this, because if the world liked it, there would be gratitude for the things of God. There would be this sort of understanding that God's word is good for us. But there's this pushback to God's word. Nobody really wants the truth. We all just want to feel good. And I'm using very, very blanket statements. But that's really where our culture has come to, is we want to hear that everything's going to be okay no matter what choice we make. And the reality is that's not true. Amen. It's just not true. We can make life-altering, life-damaging decisions 
in any given moment. And yes, we need grace and heart, but we also need truth and spine. And I fear that we as a group of Christians, people who believe in Jesus, we've lost our spine because we don't want to be labeled as those Christians. Christians with conviction, Christians who believe in certain truth, absolute truth. We don't want to be labeled because because we'll get canceled over that. These are tricky topics. The, uh, The result of being afraid of being accused of hate and being canceled has most of us walking in the wilderness of truthlessness. And when we really need to grow and we really need maturity in our lives, we don't have the truth to build it on. So Jesus is the one who modeled this the best for us. He's the ultimate example of spine and heart. If you want to jump around with me, you can. We're going to do a quick little uh, Bible study search about the life of Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says this, The Word, referring to Jesus, <clears throat> The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory. Get that word, glory. The thing that makes Him so great. We have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Why is He so glorious? He is full of what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. He's full of grace and truth. And I know people who read this and they're like, oh, yes, I'm glad we're talking about Jesus because, you know, we spent last year reading through the Bible, and this time last year you were reading the Old Testament. Some of you spent the majority of the year in the Old Testament. Do you know how often last year as we were reading through the Bible, some of you are doing it again this year, I'm going to get the same questions. People are going to come to me and go, I don't know if I like the God of the Old Testament. I don't like him. He's mean. He's judgmental. He has wrath. He brings consequences. He seems too harsh. I like Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. Jesus is the one who's a lot softer, a lot nicer. I want to hang out with him. He has more grace. Don't you feel this way? I have felt this way reading the Bible. Let's keep reading. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says, The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Wait a minute. So now we understand Looking at Jesus is actually to see God. He's the image of the invisible God. Paul is writing this to the Colossians with the only perspective of God being the Old Testament. That is his only context to who Almighty God is. So when he says, let me describe to you the God that we believe in, the God of the Old Testament, he says, look at Jesus. To which we go, wait a minute. I don't like the Old Testament God. I want the New Testament Jesus. Same thing. Same God. You go, come on, Andy, prove it. Show me in the Bible. Okay, Revelation chapter 19. We just got done reading that, if you're reading the Bible, in a year. Revelation chapter 19. Hang with me, it's a long passage. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True, Jesus. With justice, he judges and wages war. Wait, wait, wait. Jesus? Yep, Jesus. The one called Faithful and True, the one on the white horse. He's the one who judges with justice and wages war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has, his, uh, has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. <clears throat> he is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood. His name is the Word of God. That's what John told us in John chapter 1. His name is the Word of God. Verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him. Oh, so he's like a commander of an army? You know what God is referred to in the Old Testament? The God of heaven's armies? The Lord of heaven's armies? It's him, Jesus. Riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 15, coming out of his mouth, Jesus' mouth, was a a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Uh Uh-oh, we're in one of those. He will rule them with an iron scepter. Does that sound soft and fluffy and warm and fuzzy to you? He treads the uh, winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh has this name written, 
King of kings and Lord of lords. So John, who had the revelation, describes to us Jesus as he is. The God of the Old Testament is not different than the Jesus of the New Testament. They're one. And this balance that we are longing for, it's not really even a balance. There's this undeniable reality of both grace and truth, spine and heart, that exist in Jesus. And we need to understand this so much more. Certainly Jesus has heart. He's empathetic. He loves to listen and understand. He loves to help those who are hurting and struggling. He loves to give hope to the hopeless. And Jesus has spine. He loves to speak the truth into your life. He loves for you to know the truth about yourself, about your sin, about this world, and most importantly, the truth about him and forgiveness and the cost of following him. See, I wonder sometimes what people think about our church. We've been running this thing for about four years, a little over four years. And one of the greatest compliments we get or comments we get about our church is they love, everybody loves the name, Grace Valley. I love the name because that, that name is personal to me. Like it, that's what happened. Going through a major valley in my life, I found the grace of Jesus in my life in a, in a way that I never had seen it before. But I wonder if some people see that word grace and they think, oh yeah, let's go to Grace Valley because they'll be, they'll be soft on sin and big on grace. I wonder if that's what people think. Maybe, maybe Grace Valley is a little more watered down, a little less potent when it comes to the truth of God. I want to tell you, the church's name is Grace Valley. We're not changing the name. But we might as well have called it Grace and Truth Valley. Because that's what's in the valley. Had, had God not met me with grace, with heart, in the valley, and truth, spine, candor, I would not have grown. You guys know that. You've been in valleys. You know. You didn't just need the love of God or the grace of God in that context, the softness or the tenderness of God, you also needed the truth of God. You needed to know that God was not going to just turn a blind eye to your sin. Why? Because it was sin that caused so much trouble or the sin of others that caused so much trouble. So please know, we're not soft on sin here. Amen. At least one of you agrees. Thank you, Randall. But the reality is, what kind of love would that be? I truly, truly, more than you even know, I love this church family. I love you. And I, I don't, I cannot in good conscience be a good pastor if I don't hold up grace and truth. If I don't make sure I teach with heart and spine. We have to learn to be people with heart and spine. So, John chapter 4, which is where we set out to go, is going to help us understand how Jesus did this. We're going to learn how to be people with heart and spine today. So John chapter 4, this is the famous passage of Jesus and the woman at the well. Verse 4, we open up and it says, <clears throat> And he, Jesus, had to pass through Samaria. So he went to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field of Jacob that had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from the journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Without getting into too much detail here, Jesus felt it was necessary to go through Samaria. Now, culturally speaking, nobody would want to do this, not if you were Jewish. The Jews and the Samaritans were like mortal enemies. They did not like each other. They were really like, not mortal enemies, like they wanted to kill each other. They were like social enemies. They didn't want to be around each other. They loved talking bad about each other. All the off-color jokes were about each other, okay? That was how it worked between the Jews and the Samaritans. So Jesus takes a direct route into Samaria. The scripture says he needed to go or it was necessary for him to go. He goes in order to ultimately find this well and meet with this woman. By the way, Jesus doesn't do things accidentally. Let's keep reading. Let's go down to verse 7. Uh, a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, he meets this woman at this well. He, it was, he was intentional. He meant to go there and meet with her. Now, side note, 
I'm a huge believer because it's in the Bible. I'm a believer in the sovereignty of God, which means God is in control of all things. Even when it doesn't seem like he's in control, he's still in control. And because I believe in the sovereignty of God, I do not believe in simple coincidence. I don't believe that things just happen accidentally. I think God is involved in the details of our world and our lives. Which is why I believe that whether, whether you think it or not, I believe God intended for each of you that are here today to be here today. I think everyone that's watching online, God intended for you to open up your laptop and watch online today. I believe that God is orchestrating the different issues and the different details of our lives in order to meet with us. So I can say with absolute confidence, you aren't here by accident. And if you're not here by accident, the question is, then why, what purpose is it that I'm here? It's not random, it's not accidental, it's not coincidental. Then it forces the question, then for what purpose am I here? I will tell you because I believe Jesus wants to meet with you. I think Jesus has some things to say to you. I think he wants you to understand his heart for you. And I think he wants to deliver some truth to you. I think that's why you're here. So this woman meets or comes to the well, and then Jesus speaks to her. He says, give me a drink. Verse 8, the disciples had gone into the city to buy food. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For In the parentheses, John includes, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So this is outrageous what Jesus is doing. Socially, it's outrageous. How could you be doing this? I mean, this is similar to last century, last mid-century, when there were different, different water fountains for different people. This is similar. There's deep racism here, deep hatred for the other person. And Jesus walks right into that. He violates all of those cultural norms. He goes up to this well, meets to meet this woman, meets her, and then goes further and asks her for a drink. I'm telling you, you remember when you were kids and you were in school and someone said, well, if you touch that person or if they touch you, you're going to get cooties? Okay, this is like first century cooties. Nobody would be doing this. So Jesus asked her for a drink. And then she says, how is it that you can ask me for a drink. She calls out the issue here. And then he says in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, then you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So now he's willing to, he's willing to have fellowship with her. He's trying to connect with her. I'm telling you that for, in the first century, this wouldn't happen, especially for a rabbi. Two things in this world you can count on. One is that my wife will not drink after our children, and two, Jews will not drink after Samaritans. Like, that's just like two things you can count on. That's death and taxes. I mean, that's it. I needed to do that joke. That was fun. Um, She will not drink after our children, man. They're they're gross. Um, So then he says, I would offer you living water if you'd ask me. And then the woman said to him in verse 11, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. How do you get that living water? So she's sort of interacting here. She's engaging. What's going on here? Well, Jesus is leading with heart. He's leading with compassion. He's leading with respect and honor. And so she's leaning in. And so she's like, well, hey, well, how do you get this living water? This well's pretty deep and you don't have anything to draw water with. She's sort of playing along here. He says, she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. So she's talking about this whole issue. Are you greater than our father Jacob? In other words, do you have some secret we don't have? Like, what are you talking about? So she's engaging the conversation. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water, I just imagine him, he's sitting on the side of this, this well, and he points down to the water. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now Jesus is using some really important language here. 
He says, anyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. He's calling out the reality that our, our basic physical needs just live on repeat. If, if we're thirsty with the need for real water, we gotta, get, we gotta keep doing that. We're never gonna fully satisfy that. But then Jesus takes that illustration deeper into the heart. We all have these spiritual thirsts down in us. Real thirst. It's the stuff that drives us to do most of what we do in life. We're trying to solve something on the inside. What are you thirsty for? And you know, not, not like, I need a Gatorade. Like, what are you thirsty for? Probably for a better income. Probably most people in this room are, are thirsty for a better income. Thirsty for maybe a nicer house. Maybe a nicer car. Maybe thirsty for a better relationship in your marriage. Maybe thirsty to connect with your adult children who've moved on. Maybe thirsty for some resolve. Maybe you need something to, to be solved or sorted out in your life. You know, last Sunday we had our Lord's Supper Sunday where we don't have a traditional worship service, but you come and go and you take the Lord's Supper. And a part of that is I had the privilege of praying with the various families that came and several of our staff were able to pray with the families that came. What I realized in all of those prayers is the amount of thirst we all have. How much we're really needing God to, to answer and to deal with in our lives. We, we need God to move. What are you thirsty for? What do you really need in your life? And so Jesus says, the water that I give will become inside of you a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, it will solve something in you that allows you to think more about your eternal life than your temporary life. It allows you to look at the world and go, I don't need all that. I don't have to have all that to be happy. I can be happy with God. That's powerful. I know for some of you, that's like, I just like spoke a foreign language. The whole idea of being content in this life and being satisfied with the next life seems like a foreign language to many of you. This is what he's talking about. And so then, we jump down to verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come draw water. So now she, she's tracking along here, I want this. <clears throat> I, I, I'm ready to buy what you're selling, Jesus. Tell me how to get this water. And this is when Jesus takes a hard turn. For all of you that have been living under this idea that Jesus is all rainbows and roses and that Jesus is all like lovey-dovey and he's never going to tell you a hard thing, he's never going to be firm, just hold on to your seats. Jesus says to her in verse 16, go call your husband and come here. Oh. See, Jesus knew something about her. He knows something about me, too. He knows something about you. He knows stuff that we've never told him. He knows what's going on in our heart. He says, go call your husband. Because, see, she's carrying a secret. At least with Jesus, it's a secret. That she's had five husbands. He's going to call it out in a minute. Five husbands. This is her most painful part of life. This is the stuff that we don't want to think that Jesus will do. Jesus speaks directly into your greatest source of pain and or your lesser sources of identity. Jesus goes right for it. He showed her that he cared. He showed her that he loved her. He showed her that he was compassionate. But then he's like, it's like he's swinging a baseball bat. He goes right for her most vulnerable issue. He pulls a Dr. Olds. I'm telling you, I know that feeling. When I read that letter, I felt so exposed. I felt like this woman at the well when Jesus says, oh no, I know your secret. I know where you've been wronged. I know where you've done wrong. And he calls out this whole issue. And he does that with us too. What is your greatest source of pain? What is your lesser source of identity? See, we do that. We all have pain in our lives that we've collected over the different experiences we've gone through. We have real pain in our lives. And, the, you know, I'll tell you, the most painful is, is not what someone's done to us. The most painful is what we've done to ourselves. That's the most painful. And Jesus will point right at that. He will call it out, and he will bring the truth to that scenario so that we have to face it. Because Jesus loves you enough 
to speak the truth into your life for your own growth and maturity. Yeah, thank you. Because he does. You know, I don't know that the world is necessarily wrong about Jesus. Is he loving? Yes. He's absolutely loving. I just think the world has an incomplete view of Jesus. And I will tell you that an incomplete view of Jesus is as damaging as a wrong view of Jesus. We need a complete view of Jesus. It is grace and truth. It is heart and spine. His love includes all of it. So if we're going to celebrate the love of Jesus, we must celebrate his grace and we must celebrate his truth in our lives. So whatever sin you've carried, whatever issue you've thought remained a secret down inside you, Jesus says, no, I want to talk about that. I want you to be vulnerable about that. I want to deal with that in your life because it's harming you. It's causing pain in your life. It's stealing from you because it is. And this other side of the coin is this identity thing we do. Man, if there is any topic that is hot right now in our culture, it is self-selected identity. I'm going to be whatever I want to be. Let me tell you something. You can try all you want. It will not satisfy your thirst. This woman is trying to manage her identity. She's trying to hide her identity. She's trying to cover up what's going on. All this stuff. I don't care what you do to your body or what you wear or how you talk or where you go. You don't get to change the fundamental reality that you were made by God. And the only thing that makes sense is a relationship with him. You don't get to change that. And so what Jesus will do in his grace, through his word, he will call out stuff like our false ideas about our own identity. Whether it's sexual, whether it's how you define yourself with career or money or or prestige or privilege, whatever this is, however you identify yourself, Jesus will gladly call that out and go, that's not going to work for you. And the only way you will pretend it works for you is to dismiss the truth of God. It's the only way. And then you'll just be chasing a delusion for the rest of your life. And so, Jesus establishes care, leans into candor. He establishes heart and leans into spine. So the woman says to him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right, saying, you have, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. So Jesus shows that he knows. He says, I know what's going on, and he proves it. Now, I know, the feeling of all this is I don't like this. I'll just tell you the secret. I don't always like it either. But here's what we have to settle How do we know if we're loved? How do you know if you're loved? Can you believe you're loved if there's not truth involved? And not just hand-selected truths. I mean, overarching truth. Can you really know that you're loved without some element of truth? So there's some things. How How do we become better at this? I want to give you some tools to help you with this because here's the thing. You have other people in your life. Not only do you need to understand this as God relates to you, you need to understand this as you relate to others. How do you love other people around you? Well, we've got to be more like Jesus. So, if you have heart without spine, the relationship will become dysfunctional. You guys know people like this, right? They're all heart and they're no spine. That's like the definition of dysfunctional relationship. That's like codependency. That's people who are always rescuing each other. Like there's no real health in that relationship. It's this funky dynamic of just saying whatever I have to do to keep this relationship going. Some of you are in marriages like that. Where you just sort of put up with all this bad stuff in the name of love. And the relationship is deteriorating day by day but you think you're going to solve it by being the one who just absorbs all the frustration. That's dysfunctional. 
That's you taking responsibility for things you're not responsible for. And that's unhealthy. So if we have all heart and no spine, we become dysfunctional. Let's flip it. What if we have all spine without heart? The relationship becomes distant. <coughs> You've had relationships like that where it feels like this person is just hard to get to know. Like they're too, they're too separate. Because it seems like everything you do is wrong. Because you, you don't feel like they care about you. All you feel like is they criticize you all the time. Some of you are marriages like that. Do you know why people criticize all the time? Because it's a great way to keep a distance. That's easy. That makes life easy. I don't have to actually deal with you because I can keep you farther away. So what do we do? We have to have heart and spine. We have to be able to care for someone truly and tell them the truth. And this is very important for you to learn in relationships. In fact, this is an important way that we should function as a church family. We should operate with spine and heart. Heart and spine. This happens in the workplace. Because you'll think about your boss, and you'll think, well, I can't, I can't say anything critical because he'll get mad, and I don't, want, I don't want to deal with that. And so you just accept the distance between you and your boss. What if you cared enough to go to him and say, look, I care about my job and I care about this relationship and I want this work relationship to be good, but I also want to tell you how your decisions are affecting me every day. <laughs> See, now that's a healthy work environment. You say, oh, my work environment's toxic. Well, there's, there are toxic people that create toxicity and there are regular people who accept toxicity and who perpetuate it by their passivity. Who's more guilty? Everybody's guilty. So we need to learn how to operate with spine and heart. This is one of the things I'm trying to learn how to do as a pastor. Because I know, because I grew up in an environment like this where some of you grew up this way where there's a preacher that beats on the pulpit and yells at you. You've been a part of those churches. And then I've been a part of services where I feel like the pastor gets done and it's 40 minutes later and it's like, did he say anything? Like, that was great. I just don't know what he said. I've been a part of both. Both have their strengths. And both have their weaknesses. So here's what I'm wondering. I don't know if, I have, I don't know if I've earned this with you. I hope I have. I hope in four years, or however long I've known some of you, I hope you know that I care. I really do. I hope you know that I care about you. That I'm in it for the long haul. I think there are lots of people in this church that would testify. Andy means what he says when he says he'll walk with people in the valley. I will. Amen. I will do it. I will not give up on you. I will walk with you because people walk with me. So I will pay it forward. But I also am compelled through God's word to say the truth about certain things that need to be said. So I want to practice today if I can with a couple of things I'm just going to read these I wrote them I'm going to read them are you addicted to pornography if you are my heart goes out to you I have great compassion for you in that struggle I will not make light of the way lust and pornography can grip your heart and your mind and at the same time I want you to face the reality of your impure thoughts and your impure actions and confess them as sin to God. To repent and change your mind about those things. To align with God's word on walking in purity. In the name of Jesus, stop. Find healthy community and do your work to surrender this issue to him. Number two. In your marriage, are you holding a grudge? Can you admit this morning that there is no such thing as an innocent party in marriage? In the name of Jesus, stop. Put down your entitlement as a spouse. Put down your selfishness. Ask for forgiveness and be quick to forgive your spouse. If it seems too much, please seek godly counsel. Jesus has already spoken on this matter. What God joins together, let no man separate. This applies to you as well. You are not equipped to handle breaking apart what God has joined together. 
Number three, are you perpetuating division in relationships or in this church? If you have engaged in gossip or divisive talk or actions, I am calling you to repentance. Whatever justification you have allowed yourself to use to excuse this stuff is unacceptable. In the name of Jesus, stop. Confess your sin to God. Take your offenses to the correct person. Make a commitment to talk to and not about. Number four, last one. The Bible speaks not only to the sins we commit, but the good that we omit. Is there good you know God has called you to do, but you are avoiding it for some reason? In the name of Jesus, stop. Follow through on what God has said for you to do. Back to the well. Jesus meets with this woman. And he goes for everything she's trying to hide. He's not afraid of her sin or your sin. He's not afraid to call out your sin or her sin. He loves you enough to give grace and truth. The woman said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she changes the subject and says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You have to know that that is the natural reaction to God shining the light of truth in your life. Let's change the subject. Everybody does it. I do it. You do it. We all do it. She did it. Jesus entertains it for a minute. Verse 21, he said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither this mountain nor, Jeru- nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. <clears throat> for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He's the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. This is her departure comment. She's got the water. She's on her way. See you, Jewish man. I'm leaving. One day the Messiah is going to come. He'll solve all this. You've gotten too close. I'm leaving. And then Jesus says, the one who, uh, uh, I who speak to you am he. He says, I am the Messiah. I'm the one. He reveals himself to be God. And this is when she understands it. Oh, he does know. This is the answer. This is the one that I need. He really was there to solve her thirst. And verse 28 says, Then leaving her jar of water, no longer important, the woman went back to the town and told the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came to the town, <clears throat> out of the town and made their way to him. Do you know what you see immediately? Is that she no longer carries shame. Why? Because Jesus met her with spine and heart and she no longer carries the shame. She can go back in town and be open about all her junk. Why? Because she's not worried about them. Because she has found real acceptance with God. She understands where she stands. And some of you need that today. Some of you need to get to the point where you can confess your sins to God knowing that he doesn't meet you with shame. He meets you with healing. He meets you with recovery. He meets you with help. And I will tell you, we need, I need to see and hear the truth of God so that I can struggle, I can try to push him away, and I can ultimately agree and say, God, you're right. I need to confess that out of my life. I need to repent and change my mind over that. God, I need to come back to you in your way. So I hope that this morning you would be willing to do that. We're going to respond to this message. And I want to make sure to invite you, if you would like to come down front. This front is open for you to come and do business with God. I told you this a couple of weeks ago. There's something powerful about leaving your seat and coming forward. There's no, no magic in it. I think it just sends a message to yourself that you're serious. So I want to invite you to come down and pray at these stairs or pray with one of us who will be up here. We'll have men and women up here for the different men and women who may want to come to pray with you. It can be about anything. You can come and just receive prayer for some issue going on in your life, some need that you know, a family member, a friend you want prayed for. Or you can come down and say, look, I need to confess my sin. You know, the Bible tells us if we confess our sins to one another, God is faithful 
to forgive us of our sins, and he'll heal us. You don't have to confess to me like I'm some priest. You can go directly to God. But confessing to one another is one of the ways we get freed from shame. Jesus is serious about your health and your growth, and he's so serious. He's willing, even if he has to, to hurt you with the pain of pointing out the failure or the struggle or the issue so that you'll grow. He's willing to be like Dr. Olds was for me. Willing to bring some brutal honesty to someone who was believing a lie. I finally came to the conclusion I'm not that big a deal because I stand in front of big rooms of people and talk does not make me a big deal. It took me a long time to get there. And not only do I believe it, I, it's, a, it's a fearful reality for me. I am not a big deal. He is. And the best I can be up here is when I tell you the truth about him. So this morning, would you be willing to respond? Would you be willing to confess a sin? Would you be willing to have God remove some sin struggle in your life today? Start this year off differently. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you. God, we need you more than we even know. And so, Lord, I pray for this whole church family, God, that you'd speak this morning, that your spirit would move. God, that we would be unafraid to take ownership of the sins that we struggle with. God, that we would not live in the false reality of thinking that everything's okay when it's not. Holy Spirit, would you please convict right now? Would you give people the courage to respond as we sing to you in Jesus' name? Amen. Let's stand and sing. Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generation. So why would he fail now? He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I've built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would He fail now? He won't
He won't fail. He won't fail. No, he won't fail. He won't. Okay, you can have a seat for a few minutes. You would think with as many times I've heard the song that I would know when I'm supposed to come up. Obviously, I did not. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so if you are a guest with us today, we are uh, so happy that you came. Um, if you have a listening guide and you filled out the uh, info card, you can drop those in the black boxes as you exit in the back. Um, it's also where we take our tithes and offerings. So if you came prepared to give of your tithes and offerings, you can drop those in the black boxes as well. Or you can go to gracevalleymemphis.org slash give uh, and set up online giving there. Uh, a couple of uh, really important things we have going on give, uh, coming up soon. Um, the, as Andy mentioned, we have a um, state of the church uh, gathering that we are doing tonight. Um, that is at 5.30. Um, this will be an annual gathering. Uh, there will be no kids ministry available, for, uh, uh, kids ministry available for this event, but um, it's going to be a great night. So um, come here about the church, what we have going on, what, uh, what's been going on, and what's coming up. Uh, it'll be a great night. Um, also, if you are a uh, if you serve here in any way whatsoever, um, we are inviting you to an event we call uh, You Matter. Um, that is coming up January 27th. This is a free event for you. Uh, it is 8.30 to 12. That Saturday, you can register at gracevalleymemphis.org slash you matter um, and uh, see more details about it there. Uh, also, we are back with groups. Groups are kicking back off. We are in a new year. It is exciting, and we have so many ways for you to get involved here at Grace Valley Church. Uh, Victor will be out in the lobby um, where the uh, banner, the, the LED banner wall uh, is, um, and he's happy to answer any questions you have, but if you are interested, you can go on our website. We have all the groups listed there. Um, there are so many things to, I mean, we have grief share, we have celebrate recovery, we have Bible studies, home groups. Um, some of you might have noticed that our basketball court might look a little uh, weird, like we have extra lines. Uh, we now have pickleball uh, lines set up in this gym. Um, and so on Thursdays, we actually are going to have a pickleball group. So if that's something you're interested in.